Forget Year of the Voice. Response variables mean that Home Assistant no longer needs you to automate the boring stuff. Welcome back to Slacker Labs. My name is Jeff. <laughs> response variables. Yeah, this video is all about response variables and Jinja. Because if you combine the new response variables with a little Jinja, you can create a true smart home using nothing but Home Assistant. And when I say true smart home, I mean a smart home that just updates your automations as you add and remove devices. No more replacing a Z-Wave switch and then having to go edit that automation that controls that switch with the new entity ID. And forget the shortcut of renaming that new entity ID to match the old one so you can skip having to edit the automation. You don't even need to know the actual entity IDs of your devices anymore. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Before I show you the future, let me show you how these response variables work. First off, any of the scripts or automations that you're going to see in this video will be linked to in the description, so you can grab them and use them for inspiration or whatever. And just know more videos about what I'm doing with these response variables will be coming. I mean, in the last week, I've rewritten Jarvis and my room present system, so I have a lot to talk about. For this video though, I want to show you the basics and give you some examples of how powerful these response variables are. And in that process, we're going to talk some Jinja. So if you're wanting to know some Jinja, stick with me. Okay, response variables. The whole idea with response variables is this. Let's say you have this really cool automation that based on how it gets triggered, sends a different tagline or saying to your phone. I know, not super cool, but stick with me. Like maybe when someone presses a button, or when that vibration sensor. I mean, what do you call your Acara vibration sensor? You have one of these, right? Because nothing says smart home like hitting an object to turn on the TV, which we could have done with the TV remote we walked past, right? I mean, come on. Oh, the Zigbee. <laughs> oh, the Zigbee. Yeah. Oh, the Zigbee. Oh, the Zigbee. Oh, what else was I going to do with this thing? Anyway, down in the action section, we have a variable section that assigns the taglines to different variables. Then in the choose action, we have our triggers defined along with an action that sends those appropriate taglines based on the trigger. This is a pretty common pattern, but with response variables, we can now use a script to handle some of that for us. So we create a script named get taglines and in the sequence have a variable section. Here, I created the same variables that we had in the automation. Then under those, create another variable called taglines. And in this one, I create what Pythonistas would call a dictionary, which is just a dressed up term for a series of key value pairs, where we have a key followed by a colon, and then the value we wanna use any time we mention that key, you know, kinda of like a dictionary. Here, I've created a key, and yes, when doing this, I typically keep them the same, just so it's easy for me to know when I'm looking at the variables, which one of those the key refers to. And the value of the key is some Jinja that gets the value of the variable above. And I did that for each one of these variables, putting them in this key colon value pair pattern, with each one separated by a comma, and all of them wrapped in a curly brace. This dictionary is an important part of making all of this work because as of today, your response variable does need to be a dictionary. If not, Home Assistant's gonna complain and your script's not gonna work. Then after the variable section though, we can call this stop service. This stop service tells the script to, well, stop. And here we can put a message that describes why we're stopping this script. Although for what we're using the stop action for in this example, this message really doesn't matter. Then one of the attributes of stop is response underscore variable. And here, we just need to tell it to send back that dictionary we stored in the variable taglines. How you get your data from your script into this dictionary format is up to you. But I like using a variable section like this to gather up all the data I want in the output. So sometimes I have a variable section at the beginning of the script, then do some action with those variables, and then have another variable section below that where I collect the information I want the script to output. Then I can call the stop action and pass that variable. The one thing that doesn't work is defining the dictionary in the actual response variable of the stop action. For whatever reason, Home Assistant doesn't like that. And I don't know of an easy way to convert a string like this into a dictionary 
using Home Assistant's built-in Jinja functions. Anyway, once we've saved it and reloaded our scripts, if we go to services and call our git tagline script, you can see that it provides a response back to us. And with that done, we can promote our really cool automation to really, really cool. And we add an action to call our git tagline script and say that we want to assign what it passes back to a response variable. Here I use taglines, and this is how we refer to the data that we got back in the actions below. Now, when that automation triggers, it calls our get tagline script, gets the taglines, stores them in a variable, and then we can refer to that variable with the response variable name, dot, and the name of one of those keys from our dictionary, taglines.slackerlabs, for example. And with that, we successfully used the new response variable. Okay, someone is probably saying, you just moved the variables from the previous automation to a separate script after joking about moving the TV control from a remote to the Akara vibrator sensor. <laughs> yes, yes I did. But I hope this simple example gives you an idea of how these response variables work. Because things are only going to get crazier from here. Building on that idea, I wrote a script called Get Room Services to use with my text-to-speech system, because a big piece of that system is my notifications only play in occupied rooms. Or, if the message is meant for a specific person, it only plays in the room where that person is currently located. I plan on covering the room presence piece of that in my upcoming video on building template entities, which I'm working on finishing up. I just got distracted by response variables. But the way this room service script works is when I call it, I pass it the name of a room and it gives me back the entity ID of the media player I want Jarvis to use. As you can see, I simply mapped media players to rooms and then used some decision logic to take the room that we passed this script and send back the correct media player. This means I don't need to hard code the media player entity in my notifications. I simply give that service a room and call this script in my notification process to get the correct media player. This script decodes it and provides that media player back, which gets dropped into my notification service call. But setting this up like this means that if my media players change, I have to come back and update this. And this is supposed to be a smart home. There should be some smarts, right? Besides, Home Assistant already knows what rooms my media players are in because I put them in areas based on the rooms. So with that, we should be able to skip the whole having to create the room media player map that requires updating. And that's exactly what I did. Now, before we get into this, let me warn you, this does require some Jinja and probably not basic Jinja. We're gonna be using some more advanced stuff that builds on the Jinja that we've already covered in the previous mastering template videos. Actually, it probably takes a leap forward. So if you see something that doesn't quite make sense, drop a comment and I'll make sure to clarify it in the next Jinja video. But I wanted to show you how this response variable could change how you build your automations. And besides, any of what I'm gonna show you can be grabbed off my GitHub and dropped into your smart home. And in a minute, you'll see that I mean that literally. Okay, let's take that room services script where we pass it a room name and get back the entity ID of the media player we want to use in our text-to-speech notification. As I said in the beginning, entities change and we don't wanna to have to update our script every time that happens. So with a little response variable in Jinja magic, the room services script looks like this, which goes from a lot of hard-coded values to just a small Jinja template. Since these devices are assigned to areas, then we can just use the room that we already supplied and let Home Assistant use that to tell us what media players are in that room. And that works as long as the value we're using in the room variable is the same as the area name or ID that you want to search. We just use a little Jinja template to get a list of all our media players, filter it to the room we want, and then filter it to the specific media player we want. In this case, I'm using Amazon Echoes for Jarvis, which has an attribute none of the others have. So I end up with just one entity ID. And now when I call this script, pass it a room, I get back the entity ID of the media player. And what makes this smart is if I decide to move my media players around or replace them, all I have to do is assign the new one to an area when I add it or change the area if I move it. And the next time I call this script, it'll return the entity ID of the media player in that room. And all I had to do was set this script up once. 
And to me, that's pretty impressive. Now, you could build a template entity to replicate what I've done here if you didn't want to have to deal with scripts or response variables. But depending on how many entities you have and whether you're running Home Assistant on an old laptop or a full-blown server, these templates may suck resources from the rest of your smart home and things might start to slow down. This response variable method works because it only consumes resources when the automation fires, making it pretty efficient, at least in resource use, especially since we only need to know the entity ID in that specific moment. Because it's not like you're going to be displaying that on a dashboard somewhere. Or, I don't know, maybe you will. But in any case, I think the response variable method is the better way to go. Anyway, if the light bulb moment hasn't happened, then let me show you where I see this going. Here, I have a lighting automation that triggers based on kitchen occupancy. I used the choose action to route this automation to the correct lighting I wanted based on the other contacts going on in the house. You might have something similar, but you may have hard-coded your light entities in the actions where I used scenes. But in any case, I wrote a script to make all of this smarter. This one is called Get Room Lights, and it simply uses some Jinja to get all of the light entities in the room and return them back to me in a comma delimited list so that I can use them in a light service call. And so on each of the choose actions, we can just use that list of lights and turn them on and set the brightness or turn them off. And now we have a lighting automation that almost never has to be touched. The only issue is our triggers, which are currently defined to specific entities. Except in this case, that's not entirely true because these binary sensors up here are actually template entities that are using the same pattern as the get room services script. Except they just get a count of all the binary sensors in the kitchen that have a device class of motion or occupancy or door that have a state of on. And if that count is greater than zero, then the binary sensor is on and I consider the kitchen occupied. Which means we could replace these triggers with template triggers and just drop in the exact same Jinja, which evaluates true if any of those sensors are on. And now we truly have a kitchen lighting automation that never has to be touched again, unless we want to adjust the criteria around the choose action or the level of brightness. But honestly, all of that can be replaced with templates that refer to other sensors or helpers that could be adjusted on a dashboard. In any case, written as is, you could take this automation and that Get Room Light script straight out of my GitHub repo and drop it in your Home Assistant instance. And as long as you didn't have an automation that already has the same ID or a script named Get Room Lights, and you already have a kitchen area that includes at least one motion, occupancy, or door entity, and at least one light, you wouldn't have to update a single thing. This automation would just start automating your kitchen lights. And I guess it also means that now Home Assistant is the one automating the boring stuff. Music